join us this afternoon for our first in a series of virtual faculty fireside chats. I'm Haley Rupp. I'm the Director of Campaign Communications for the WSU Foundation, and I'm going to be moderating today. Prior to welcoming Dr. Swanner, I'd like to share a few virtual meeting etiquette suggestions to ensure the best possible experience for everyone. So our Zoom conference today will automatically mute everyone except the individuals who are presenting. Um, we suggest that you use the speaker view to ensure you're able to see the person speaking. This option is located in the top right hand corner of your screen. You can turn on or off your own video by utilizing the video button in the bottom left hand corner. Similarly, if you start to experience any bandwidth issues this afternoon, um, please turn off your video. Sometimes that can help. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions during uh, our chat, and um, if you want to use the chat function, if possible, that would be great. Uh, that's located at the bottom of the screen in the Zoom toolbar. If you do not have access to the chat feature, please hold your questions until the end of the presentation, and we'll do an open Q&A session at that time. Uh, finally, just to ensure your best viewing experience, we suggest you avoid other Wi-Fi activities, if possible, that may reduce your streaming bandwidth. Again, we appreciate you joining us, and I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Nancy Swanner. Dr. Swanner is the founding director of the Granger Cobb Institute for Senior Living and associate dean for intercollege partnerships in the Carson College of Business. She also serves as the faculty athletics representative for WSU. Dr. Swanner, can you kick us off with a quick overview of the new Institute for Senior Living? Of course, thanks Haley and thanks for inviting me. Thanks for sharing your lunch hour with me today, wherever you might be. I hope you're all safe and well, uh, whatever that looks like. And I, and I absolutely hope you don't know anyone in your family, have anyone in your family or friends that have uh, been hit specifically with the virus. So the Granger Cobb Institute for Senior Living has been, uh, some of you have heard this story and been part of this journey for a while. It's, it's, it's not new, but it's new. Uh, the story started almost 10 years ago now of uh, the senior living industry came to us, wanted to partner with us because of the great reputation that the hospitality school has at WSU. It's, it's 88 years of being there. Uh, we started working together, noticed the crossover, the things, the transferable skills uh, that, that people that work and operate in hotels uh, could use in senior living. Many of the departments and, and functions are exactly the same. Fast forward today, we are uh, an academically recognized unit on the WSU campus, uh, the Granger Cobb Institute for Senior Living. It is housed in the hospitality school in the Carson College of Business. Uh, we have an education component to what we do, a research component, and um, also a service component. Uh, just last Friday, uh, the fac or last Thursday, the Faculty Senate approved the addition of a third major in the hospitality school and senior living management, which is transdisciplinary, which is pretty exciting, and uh, we'll be able to uh, launch that this fall. Um, the name, just very quickly, Granger Cobb, for those of you who don't know, was a real pioneer in the industry. He was one of the early founding fathers of this idea to partner with WSU, and very sadly, Granger died. Uh, three years ago of, of cancer at the age of 55 when he was the COO of, um, uh, CEO of Emeritus. Emeritus was bought out by Brookdale and Brookdale is the largest senior living company in the country. Uh, but the folks uh, that knew and loved Granger came together and uh, put together a two and a half million dollar naming gift to honor him that has been put into an endowment that we will use as, as some of our operational money to run the institute. So that's probably the intro piece of this. Perfect, thank you. Can you explain the housing challenges that seniors and their families are currently facing? Well, uh, yes, and certainly it was, um, has been compounded recently. Um, one of the one of the projects that we're working on at, at WSU um, in in the Granger Cobb Institute for Senior Living is we are working with um, an industry partner, Merrill Gardens, to help identify a product for the for the middle market. And what what I mean by that is the current 
when, when we talk about what we're doing at WSU in, in senior living, we are talking about everything that goes from, say, age-restricted sort of life, pan, life plan communities, 55 and above, through assisted living, up through uh, dementia care. But we stop when, when we get to the 24-7 skilled nursing, nursing home model. That, that's a medical model. That's not, that's not who we are. Uh, that is very much a care-focused, uh, 24-7, high-acuity needs-driven business. We're, we're up to that. And so currently in, in this country, this is a fairly new interest, industry in all honesty. It's only, you know, the first congregate living communities probably were back in maybe the late 70s. Um, but what, what we have is we sort of have this divide. We have, we have the one end of the spectrum that has uh, a private pay model uh, of senior living, very, you know, they're very nice, beautiful. I, I kind of liken them to resorts for people who are aging. I mean, they're beautiful, um, wonderful lifestyle, well-being kinds of communities. Um, we also have those communities, and I don't mean when I say on the other end of the spectrum, I don't mean on the other end of the spectrum in terms of the care and the model. Those, those things can be quite similar. Um, what I talk about is that the other end of the spectrum includes those who are, don't have the financial means to be able to afford a private pay model, so they are, they are being paid, uh, their stay in, in a community like that would be paid by Medicare, Medicaid. The problem is, is we have a big chunk of people in the middle, the middle market, we call it the forgotten middle, um, that, can't, that make, doesn't make enough money or won't have enough money in retirement or even from the sale of probably their largest asset, which is typically someone's home, to be able to afford to private pay in, in the communities on one end, but they have maybe too much or a few too many assets to be able to qualify for a, for a Medicare or Medicaid s subsidy on the other end. So we are just about ready to launch a project um, that is going to do a series of focus groups. Those are all supposed to be face-to-face -face focus groups in parts of the country. Those are now going to be virtual face, face virtual focus groups that are starting on the 30th of this month, um, which I'm kind of excited about. We'll see how this all rolls out. Uh, but to, to just start to look at what does the product need to look like? What, what do developers need to do to put into the marketplace that, that people in that middle income range can afford um, to, to be in? So we're, we're just getting ready to launch that and uh, we're, we're very excited about that. There's a series of, of questions. We've got a whole, a whole uh, script prepared. I will tell you that the script changed a little bit uh, at the end, we are now, uh, we have added a couple of questions that look specifically at COVID-19 um, because sometimes the news that we've heard has not been so great around congregate living kinds of um, places and we need to know where people stand. And I will tell you also, just as an interesting side note, these decisions tend to fall uh, on um, in, in, a, in when you're making decisions for your parents, they tend to fall on the old daughter the only daughter or the daughter-in-law. So the, the participants in our focus groups, we are looking for women that are aged 45 and older. And uh, not to say that, you know, sometimes men aren't involved in, I, I don't mean to be exclusionary there, but, but the research shows that most often it's, it's women. So uh, that's where we're starting and we'll see what happens. Wonderful. How would you say that WSU is uniquely positioned to help solve this crisis? Well, you know, one of the things is um, from day one, this, this institute and the work that we're doing has been driven by the industry. I'd love to tell you that I had this great vision and this great idea about where we should, you know, how, how we should make hospitality more inclusive and bring in this segment. Yeah, I didn't even know what we were talking about. When these people first approached me, I didn't even know. My parents still had lived in their own home. I didn't even know what it was. And so... Um, because of that focus, we have tons of industry connections, and, um, and they want to help us. They want to help us. Uh, they want our students, ultimately, uh, whether it be our traditional students that come out of a four-year program. We're also launching an online certificate program uh, for people who might want to transition in, but they want to be involved. And, and our whole goal in all of this is to, to sort of help solve, through our research, is to help real, to solve real problems in real communities that really do make a difference. And so we've got to, you know, right now, um, I just transitioned into this, the, the official naming happened last October. 
Um, I transitioned into this new role in January. And so it's all, it's all fairly new, but even, even in that short amount of time, we have, we have four projects that are sort of underway and it's, it's connecting different faculty. We're working with faculty across the campus. We have this group called faculty fellows. It's not a, it's not an exclusionary group. It's not a, you know, a secret handshake decoder ring kind of entrance thing. It is, I just started putting the call out and said, hey, do you happen to be doing some work in, in, in aging or in, in, the, in the senior space? And we started bringing people together. And we've got people from um, multiple campuses in multiple disciplines. And then as the industry sort of reaches out to me, um, I try to put the people together in the right space. So I'll tell you, it's been super interesting and I, I am excited about it because for the first time, well, I shouldn't say the first time, but it, it is an example of, of, of possibly working across the silos that we tend to have in, in the academic world. I hate to say that, but it's real. Um, you know, I've got, for example, we've got, we're getting ready to do a project uh, uh, on all things, of all things with bidets in dementia care. And we're using a, a vendor partner with that. Uh, Dr. Catherine Vanson from the Vancouver campus uh, is, is a gerontologist and she's working on that. And she's working with um, Dr. Min Young Saruti from uh, Interior Design on the Pullman campus. They're looking at it from different angles. So we're bringing people together whom, whom you know, around this project that may be collecting data in different ways to solve different problems, but that ultimately are to the benefit of the industry. So I think that's, that's fairly unique. Um, and, and again, it's the industry sort of coming to us because they know what we're trying to do now and they know that we, we listen. Um, I'm a restaurant rat. I can't, I have to rely on them. My background is, is, is running restaurants, which is not the greatest place to be right now today. I'll just tell you that right out front. Um, but so I have to rely on them and their expertise to get us from point A to point B. But I, but I can bring the right people, get the right people on the bus to, to look at some of these issues and solve the right problems. So I think that does make us fairly unique and it's pretty exciting. Great, thank you. You mentioned that you're getting ready to start a few focus groups at the end of this month. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the impacts of that research when it's complete? Absolutely. Um, you know, the thing is, I think that, again, when you talk about um, when you talk about the whole middle income market, not really having a product out there that serves them um, to, to help define what that might look like. And that's going to have to be in several areas. Certainly, the price point is going to have to matter. So, you know, what kinds of amenities and services can you provide within certain price points um, to, to make it all work? Uh, you know, right now, we, and, and, we've, and we've got to jump on this quickly, the, the baby boomers, the oldest baby boomers right now are 74. And the average age in senior living communities um, is, you know, people think to move in, they're probably, you know, 82, 84, you know, average age in there, you know, 84, 85, 86, somewhere in there. So, so the baby boomers haven't even started to put the demand on that industry yet and they're a huge group and and they but there's not a product out there for all of them um and even even if even if they were somehow magically able to 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 afford or qualify whatever it is for the product that's out there there's not enough product out there now right now today there's too much product people have started to build overbuild a little bit in anticipation of that and no one foresaw a pandemic coming um, so the one thing about senior living from, from, I, and I've been trying to coach our, our hospitality kids on this, um, a little bit as best I can, uh, you know, this senior living is, is a bit, a bit more recession proof than, than many of the traditional hospitality, um, operations where, where occupancy is starting to fall off in a little bit in the senior living spaces is, is that move-ins are, it's, it's hard to put, to bring, put, put, well, nobody can go in and tour. So they're doing vir virtual tours but it's hard to move people in because if you move them in, they have to immediately go into a 14 day quarantine. So, you know, people are kind of not, that's not an exciting thing to think about. But when you look at it from, from, from the other side, from the hospitality side, sadly, anytime there's a change in the, in, in the economy and a downturn, the hotel, especially from business travel, the hotel industry is the first to feel it and they're the last ones to come out of it. And, and all of our students that had, you know, summer uh, internships and things lined up and our students even that were graduated last year have all been furloughed. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a difficult time. Um, 
but but this this gives our students because of their their training and their background other options and angles to grow so so i'm i'm hoping that that right now if we can have the right the right employees into the into the pool and help develop the right product that for the next 40 years or so um you know young college grads in in hospitality and other majors are are could could very well be set because the demand is huge but the product is not yet there for for everyone to be served. So we're going to try and do our part and I think I think I think it's it's exciting, super exciting. And as somebody that's a young baby boomer, I very much care about this because I have four great kids, but if you think I'm trusting on any of them for my care as I age, not. And and nor should I. I you know, uh, my mom is 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 90 and a half now um lived in her own home till she was 89 with my dad and my dad died and my mom is now i've I've now become that adult consumer uh, adult child consumer of the product my mom uh, we moved my mom into bishop place uh, last september uh because i needed her closer to me i'm not retired and and you know the worst the most difficult thing sometimes is when people have no options but to be caregivers um, in their home because that's what they can afford or, you know, and, and sometimes it's because you truly want to, but I will tell you, it changes up the relationship between you and your parent. And when you go from being someone's daughter or son to being their caregiver, it's not the same. It's not the same. And, and I have to tell you, I love that people are taking care of my mom and that I can just go in and bring the grandbabies in and I'm still her daughter and I call her every day and we visit and everything's grand, you know, um, Toileting a parent is a tough thing to do. Just going to say that. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Um, we'll now go into our question and answer series. So again, um, if you are able and have any questions for Dr. Swarner, please feel free to post those in the chat. Uh, we do, we did have one submitted ahead of time or a couple submitted ahead of time. So I will ask those and then also provide opportunities for people to ask questions live as well. The first question we received was some assisted care facilities have a certain number of beds available to Medicare and Medicaid people because of low interest loans from the government when they were built. At least that is how it was when my mom was in this situation. She was always in a very nice facility because I knew this and found places for her. Do you know how many beds like this are available and is this information easier to find than it was 10 years ago? Uh, well, I think it's easier to find than it was 10 years ago. I will tell you that it is, it is driven state by state. Uh, that's the other thing that makes operation uh, of senior living a little tricky because every state has its own licensing requirements and a variety of things, but this, this piece of it is absolutely regulated by the state. But as an example, and I think I, uh, uh, Haley, I think we'll be posting uh, the link if it isn't out there. But for, so, for example, in, in the state of Washington, uh, you got to the Department of uh, Social and Health Services site, and and there I have a link that you can go out and look at. And one of the things, once you're out at that link, uh, you can type in, uh, say, the county uh, where you want to search, and there's a there's a tick box on there. Um, that allows you to click only those um, communities or facilities uh, that have Medicaid, that take Medicaid or Medicare. And once you do that, then it'll, that'll come up. Now, that's not to say that all of those places that do that, those are oftentimes in communities, um, even if they're, when they're pre predominantly private pay, there's only a limited number of those, those um, apartments or units typically available. So they're kind of in high demand. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open up the floor now if anyone wants to ask a question. If not, I have a list of others we'd be asking Dr. Swanner. Remember, you will have to unmute yourself to ask a question. Okay, seeing none. Uh, another question that came in is, are there any other institutions across the US or worldwide doing a senior living institute like WSU? Great question. Not the way we're doing it. Um, there, there are there are other there are programs out there in healthcare administration, uh, a variety of things across the country. There are quite a few of them actually, but we are we are the only program 
that is housed in a hospitality school in an accredited college of business. And that, that makes us absolutely unique. And that is actually um, another, was another driving force when the industry sort of came to us. The people who came initially uh, was Jerry Meyer, who at the time was the president and COO of Aegis Living, Bill Pettit, um, CEO at Merrill Gardens, Granger Cobb, CEO at Emeritus, and Tana Gall, who was uh, the president at that time of Leisure Care. And those are all Puget Sound-based companies. Um, but they, they came to us. They wanted, you know, at the end of the day, this is, there is care and, and service involved in this model, but it's, these are still businesses. At the end of the day, they're still businesses. And that's oftentimes where the medical model and, and the other models collide is that, that you know, um, if there's no money, there's no mission. And that's, that's a sad, harsh reality. But these are, these are operations that have to, um, have to run a good business model. And so that's, that's why the industry has been so supportive of this is because we, of where we're housed. We, you know, our students understand the care and the service piece or the service piece from being in hospitality. They've got solid business fundamentals from the college and the college core curriculum that we, that we have. And so it, and then, and then the other part of that, our students in hospitality school have regard, we have three majors um, in hospitality, the traditional hospitality major, we have another very specialized major in wine and beverage business management, and then this new one in senior living management. But all of those um, majors, the students are required to have a thousand hours of paid industry experience as part of their degree requirements. And so they're all very operationally focused. And that was the other part why the industry has been so supportive in, 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 in encouraging us because a lot of the other programs that might be out there are, are graduate programs, oftentimes in gerontology. USC has a very well-known uh, graduate program in gerontology, but that's not who we are. That's not, we, we, want, we want to turn people out that are going to initially go out and run communities, make, you know, they're going to touch the lives of a resident every single day. They are absolutely going to be operationally focused. And that's who we are at our core and have been since 1932 in hospitality. So that's, um, that's one of the, that, that makes us unique um, and, and garners a lot of support from the industry. Perfect. Um, on those same lines with the student experience, it could be said that senior living is not um, a glamorous major. How do you attract students to this uh, to this uh, field. Yeah, quoting my good friend Granger Cobb, he used to always say, senior living isn't the most sexy of the jobs and industries that, that are out there. But I will tell you, one of the things, especially, uh, especially with, younger, with younger people, Generation Z, that age of, of students that are in college now, first of all, um, let me do a little bit of work, uh, some fun stuff just in, in generations in the workplace. But one of the things about Generation Z, this, this college age student we have now, they very much feel the, the weight of the world on their shoulders. They, they know or feel that the generations above them have kind of screwed things up and it is up to them to fix it. Um, and, the, uh, and, and, and then in going along with fixing what might be wrong in the world, they, they are very purposeful and they want to have very purpose driven work. They also are a generation that has grown up seeing um, having grandparents or great grandparents in in some senior living communities outside of, you know, I mean, when I grew up, it was a nursing home and that's kind of where you went to die. That's not what this is. These are very active, um, you know, wellness kinds of, of environments. And so there's been a shift there from my mindset, for example, than, the, than, than say even my kids or people in their 20s that, that we have now. And so I think it's a, it's a, if, if, if you're someone who, who wants that purposeful, meaningful work, if you do have that affinity for, for those who are aging because you had this amazing experience with grandparents, there's, there's a place for you. And so I think it's about us, you know, putting the right people the right place to tell the right story. Um, and I, and I think it can happen. Um, it's, it's going to be a little bit challenging. We've got our work cut out for us. Uh, but we also have people who even prior to now hospitality grads that have gone out and are in this space. And all I need to do is, is bring them back in through a zoom call or bring them back as a guest speaker. Um, you know, students love to hear, uh, from, from their peers or those who are just slightly older about where they are and what they're doing and what kind of a difference it makes. So, 
um, yeah, it, it might be a little bit of a tough sell. On the other hand, I think I think it's as we start it and we bring in the right groups, it'll sort of spread organically. Perfect. And uh, Alex Peach has a question for you. Hey, Nancy, it's Alex here in Seattle. Hi, Alex. Great to see you. Um, you know, I've been so impressed by this program and the industry focus it has and the, and the industry support you've, uh, you've, it has. Uh, and I'm really curious if you have any advice for folks from other programs or other colleges about how to um, engage industry in such an important and, um, you know, supportive way uh, to other programs. That's a great question. Uh, you know, sometimes I think it's about the product you have to sell to start with. Uh, you know, I certainly, you know, when we look at, at we, when we look at all the all the departments and units across a, a campus like WSU, there are some things that have a more immediate boots on the ground kind of appeal and um, impact than than maybe some others. And I and I guess I've you know been fortunate enough to grow up in hospitality where. I don't know it any other way. That's all about sort of that relationship business. It's a service business that, you know, when I, I've been at, this is my 20th, finishing my 20th year at WSU um, and the hospitality program has always, it through its alumni have always been super supportive um, uh, of the program because there's, a, we, we turn out a product that they, they can use in their business through our students. And um, so that's been fairly easy, but I, but for me, most of the time it's, it's just about, to me, it's about anything in life. It is about the relationship. Make a connection with somebody. Uh, start talking. Ask a question. Get to know what they what they might need. How can you help? Bring people together. Um, you know, become that person that sort of gives more than you take. I mean, at the end of the day, you're probably gonna you're gonna reap a lot from those kinds of um, conversations and benefits. But early on, you have to sort of gain that trust and respect and um, and build that relationship so people know that you're whatever it is you're trying to do or sell or be that you're in it together and that that you stand to have sort of some sort of a win-win partnership you have to identify that i think you have to you know and sometimes some of the you know we do them i i laughed to haley before this meeting started because i know this is a little bit about research i am probably the last person who should be doing an inaugural fireside chat about research i am not it not even close we do such amazing um you know, life changing, cancer curing, COVID finding relief research um, on our campus. That's not who I am. Um, but for those people who are doing that, sometimes it's a matter of, of finding how do you bring that down to the right level to engage the right people at the appropriate time. Some of it's just way far above most people's heads. So when you talk about sort of engaging a business community or your industry partners, they may, they may not be industry partners at the level of some of those, some of those kinds of things that are going on, unless you find a way to get it to where it makes a lot of sense. Great. Thank you. Are there any other questions from attendees? If not, I have one final one that came in the chat. Um, Dr. Swanner, how have you seen um, this partnership with industry increasing or um, has it had a positive effect on job placement for graduates? Um, we haven't, you know, so we've, we've, let me back this up. So we have tracked hospitality graduate placement for a very long time, long before I ever got to WSU. And we've always had very solid um, placements. Uh, some tracked better than others, some anecdotally uh, over the years. A couple of years ago, the college, uh, Nathan Roberts and, and uh, Dr. Hunter, uh, with Dr. Hunter's support, um, developed that, that we created a, a great way to collect placement data and created this amazing dashboard uh, that, that tracks it all. And so we are just now, you know, so in the college, we have very solid placements um, of our hospitality grads. And most of that is, I think, attributed to the fact that they have to do that thousand hours of industry experience along the way. And, and, and so the industry, you know, we do a hospitality career for every year exclusively for those students um, that probably draws, depending on the year, anywhere between 40 and 70 companies. Um, 
just of hospitality, looking for hospitality students. So our placements have always been very high. We are just now starting, you know, we've never had broken out senior living majors uh, before, and we won't even have that for a few years. So most of those placements are recorded somewhere in that, in that hospitality data. Uh, and then we're tracking a few individuals that we, we know where they've gone that are out in the industry already in senior living. But I, I will tell you, if you express a desire or an interest, you as a senior living student, you'll have multiple offers, multiple offers, um, because it's an industry that's crying for great, great help. Thank you. Okay, everyone, it is 1230. So that is our time. I want to thank everyone who joined us today. And a huge thank you to Dr. Swanner for your time and helping us kick off these firesides. Uh, we look forward to this series and we'll be in touch with everyone soon about our next faculty topic. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks, everyone.